I've got a coffee in one hand and a cat in the other, and I'm here to talk about books. Life doesn't get better than this. Mary Wollstonecraft and I have recently been reading a bunch of good sci-fi books. It's been months since I've read a good sci-fi novel or a sci-fi novel at all. I love the genre. I love it to pieces. In fact, science fiction has come to define a lot of my taste when it comes to not only books, but films, TV shows, video games, all mediums of art. I love science fiction in so many different ways and for so many different reasons, but Cat's gone nuts. She really wants to climb on the camera. She's batting at it. Oh my god. Oh. Science fiction is an enormous thing, and I love it for so many reasons. So what I did to try and get myself back into science fiction after not reading or even watching any for months and months and months is to read it kind of diversely. I picked up and I read three sci-fi books in a row that are all really different from each other to remind myself of the breadth and scope of this genre. So here are three very different science fiction novels. The first, which you can see behind me, is a book that's been universally praised in the months since it came out, and I have some polarizing thoughts about it. The second I thought was a really fun adventure story, but was nothing groundbreaking. And the third is something very, very special. Let's go. This is The Mountain in the Sea by Ray Naylor. It came out earlier this year and I picked it up immediately, that's why I have it in hardback. It took me a long while to get to it. And I'm actually planning on doing a follow-up video to this one about how reviews influence us. The reason I want to make that video is because just before I picked this up, I had a look at the consensus on Goodreads, which is a thing that I've been doing a lot this year. I got back into Goodreads after years of not touching it, and I keep turning to it to see what the general vibe is about certain books. I read a few reviews, and I check out what people generally think. This book took me by surprise, and I'll talk about this a lot more in that next video. Because the top two reviews of this book on Goodreads are a five-star review, and a one-star review, and both are really, really detailed and make excellent points. And after I read those two, I kept them in my head as I was reading this, and I kept seeing the validity of both of these arguments, which is really, really interesting. And now I can't stop thinking about how reviews influence us. Whether my experience of reading this book would have been different or not, if I hadn't read those reviews, I can't say I don't live in that timeline. But either way, this is an interesting and intriguing book that I have quite a lot to say about. The Mountain in the Sea is set on Earth a few years from now, maybe a few decades, where corporations have what seems like a monopoly on the planet itself. The world is all but led by corporate entities. And there's one enormous tech company called Dianima. And Dianima have managed to make the first ever fully conscious android. That android is one of the characters in this book. When the story of the mountain in the sea begins, we learn that Dianima has basically purchased a small archipelago off the coast of Vietnam, which is no longer called Vietnam. They've done this because this archipelago for years and years and years has been plagued by whispers and folk tales, urban legends about a sea monster that kills local divers and fishermen with real murderous kind of human intent. The ways in which people in this area die feels kind of human. There is an intelligent sea monster killing these people, and Dianima is curious about that. So the company paid off all the residents of this archipelago to ship out from their homes so that the company could take over. And they've brought in our protagonist, a woman called Ha Nguyen. She's one of the world's leading experts in octopuses, because this sea monster is one or several octopuses. So Dr. Ha Nguyen is brought into the archipelago by Dianima, she teams up with this android, and the two of them are there to investigate and learn what this strange species of octopus is exactly. How it's so intelligent, why it's so intelligent, what it's after, why it's killing people. And that's our main storyline. But there are also two other characters with separate stories, one of whom I found to be basically a waste of time, and the other was pretty intriguing. The one that I didn't enjoy is a hacker who goes from Russia to Turkey, and maybe somewhere else, and along the way receives a job that has something to do with Dianima, but at the beginning it's all shrouded in mystery. 
and I just didn't really care for this storyline. The other is about people who are being kidnapped and trafficked. They are being taken into slavery by seafaring vessels that are run by AI algorithms. The ships have no captains, they just have computers, and they are taking people on board. And we see all of this through the eyes of a Japanese man who's kidnapped by one of these ships. That story is really, really intriguing because you really don't know what's happening and what's going to happen, and everything slowly starts to make sense, but still, where will it lead? But the story of Ha Nguyen is the main story here. The author, Ray Naylor, lived in Vietnam for a long time. He has a background in international relations, in science, and in environmentalism. And he's written a lot of sci-fi short stories that reflect his background. And this is his debut novel. So everything he says here is based on his own experiences in science and environmentalism. So that makes this feel like hard sci-fi, sci-fi that has truth at its heart, possibility at its heart. Nothing here feels impossible. It all feels perfectly feasible. When it comes to the role of corporations on a global scale, when it comes to the growth of machine learning and artificial intelligence, and when it comes to the evolution of consciousness itself, it all feels possible and relatively grounded. Now, this is an incredible book in terms of its scope, what it's trying to explore. At its heart, this is a science fiction novel about consciousness, because we have an android who supposedly is fully conscious, has a human-esque working brain. And this android is helping an expert scientist investigate a newly discovered species of octopus that seems to have enormous intelligence. Now, octopuses are intelligent. This is something that I really enjoy talking about, thinking about, reading about. There are animals that we know are hyper-intelligent, things that we sometimes call non-human animals, creatures that have an almost human intelligence. These animals include our closest cousins, the chimpanzee and other great apes, dolphins, elephants, crows, and octopuses. Octopuses are mesmerizingly intelligent. And looking into that a little bit, reading books about it, watching YouTube videos about it, it's absolutely fascinating. I keep meaning to read the non-fiction book Other Minds. I've been thinking about reading that book for years, and I will eventually get to it. I'm sure it would have made a really good companion to this book, but I haven't read it yet. The ways that this novel explores artificial intelligence, human intelligence, and the evolution of intelligence, consciousness, it's all absolutely brilliant. I really enjoy the way that these things are explored, and I really enjoyed the world building as well. This not too far distant world of corporations carving out nations and moving borders around, it's really frightening and it all feels so plausible. So it's the themes and the world that really drew me in. They are the five star elements to this book. On the other hand, there are a lot of things that I really, really didn't like about this book, and number one is the characters. These are are not characters. They are not people by any stretch. They are vessels for particular themes and vessels for the plot. They are not people. I do not know them. I do not understand them. I did not feel attached to them at all. I could not give two shits about any of them, including our main protagonist, Dr. Ha Nguyen. I didn't care about her. I didn't care about any of them. It was impossible to, because these were not people. They were cardboard cutouts with plot devices written on them. And that is aggressively annoying. And it's definitely a fault within the science fiction genre. I've seen it plenty of times in classic sci-fi and modern stuff. That doesn't make it excusable, though. Why don't I care about these people? I should. I should be able to. I have a right to. We all do. But no, not at all. And the other thing I really didn't get on with when it comes to this book is the way that Naylor treats his audience. This is a book about consciousness, artificial intelligence, big themes, big ideas that sci-fi has been exploring for decades. And it's based on the realities of exploring artificial intelligence and exploring the consciousness of various hyper-intelligent animals such as octopuses. But it's patronizing as hell. Naylor really patronizes the audience. There are multiple moments, maybe one or two per chapter even, where he writes in italics a quote from earlier in the book. And it's supposed to be a character remembering something, flashing back to a moment that's important to what they're doing in this moment now, in the present, later in the book. But it's just patronizing. These little bits in italics, a sentence here or there, are patronizing the audience, saying, do you remember when that character said that thing? That's important now. That's very important, isn't it? You remember. You remember because you're a clever girl. You're a big girl. You know these things. You got it. You got it. I helped you out a little bit. 
Only a little bit. You, you got it. You're okay. Like, fuck that. The ways in which I felt patronized by this book were exhausting, and the fact that he seemed so paranoid. That's how the book sometimes reads, is like, he's paranoid that we won't be able to follow. We won't be able to understand the big ideas in this book. So he slows down. Everything feels vague. Sometimes, very ironically, things aren't explained as well as they could have been, because it feels as though Nayla was afraid to overwhelm our tiny little brains. I just felt very patronized by this, and that's a massive shame. This is a very clever book in so many different ways, but I honestly put it down and felt irritated. I was just irritated and I felt patronized. And yet I would happily read it again, and I do recommend it because the things it explores and generally how it explores them, or at least the ways in which things are framed through androids and octopuses, it's a lot of fun and it's really interesting. And Nayla is clearly an enormously intelligent person with a lot of curiosity, and I love curiosity. I'm glad he explored these things and invited us to explore these themes along with him. I just wish I hadn't felt so patronized by it all. This one will be a lot quicker and easier to talk about. This is Frontier by Grace Curtis, another book that I've had for quite a while and hadn't gotten to until now. Grace Curtis works in the video games industry, working for a small indie studio, and this is her first novel. Frontier reminds me of a lot of different things, and despite how many different stories it reminds me of, it doesn't actually feel derivative, which is very impressive. This is a book that reminds me of the world of Mad Max. It's a space western like Star Wars. Its world and characters remind me a lot of Stephen King's Gunslinger, the first Dark Tower book. I never finished the series, I got like halfway, I got bored, it went nuts. And it even reminded me of John Ford's 1939 classic film Stagecoach, which I watched when I was a teenager and I had a really fun time with. This novel is all of those things, and yet it still manages to feel wholly original, and well done to Grace Curtis for that. This is a really short sci-fi novel, but it's packed, and so it still took me a few days to get through. There's a lot going on in here. Our protagonist is a nameless traveler who has landed on Earth in search of someone. Earth in the universe of this novel has been mostly abandoned. Climate change ravaged the Earth, turned it into a wasteland, and eventually humanity fled to the stars. But a few people remained, and those who did remain make up an evangelical cult, kind of, who worship the planet itself. And this actually reminded me of the video game Final Fantasy X, where these people who are left on Earth don't use any modern or advanced technology. Like in the world of Mad Max, they survive on scraps. They trade for food and gasoline, etc., etc., and they believe technology is what got us in this mess and that we are being punished by the planet itself, Gaia, for becoming reliant on technology, polluting the planet, etc., etc. Our space traveler is a human who obviously was part of the colony that left, returns to Earth, is very confused by everything, and is hunting somebody down. At the beginning we know so little, and honestly we continue to know so little for the majority of this book. Easily more than half of it, we remain quite clueless as to what's really going on and who this character is and what she wants. But every chapter is kind of a short story, told from the perspective of someone who meets her as she's trying to find the person she's hunting down. And each chapter plays out slightly differently. It's all science fiction, but there's one chapter that's set on a train, and it feels a little bit Agatha Christie and a little bit like Stagecoach. There's a lovely blend of genres and ideas going on here, and it works really, really well. It's a simple book, and one thing I really, really didn't like is the fact that our protagonist is very inconsistent. She behaves very differently chapter to chapter, and she takes on a different name chapter to chapter, based on the title, based on what she's up to in that moment, and her personality shifts so much that I wasn't sure if each chapter was even about her at first, or if they were all different people. Her behavior is just strange. At first, she is terrifying and intimidating. She is an alien force to be reckoned with, and then in the second chapter, she's this goofy weird thing carrying a turtle around and asking silly questions and feeling out of her depth and going, uh, um, uh, uh, a lot. Didn't make sense to me at all. She is the most inconsistent protagonist I've ever read in a novel, I think. Which is really, really annoying, because apart from that, the world, all the other characters, the way that Curtis has built all of this bit by bit, it's really, really clever. Every chapter 
presents us with a new idea, a new concept, a new part of the world, its traditions, its law, its religion, all of these things are pieced together just like a jigsaw, and it's really, really satisfying. And I really like the way that things shift slightly from chapter to chapter. When you start a new one, you have no idea what kind of journey you're gonna go on for the next 10, 20, 30 pages. It's gonna be a complete mystery to you. Every single chapter will take you by surprise in some way, and I think that's awesome. But it's impossible to bond with our protagonist because she has no concrete personality of her own, and I really don't know why. But still, I'm very impressed by this Star Wars slash Mad Max slash a bunch of other things novel. It feels wholly original while taking inspiration from so many great places and building something really unique. Really, really cool stuff. And finally, we have my favorite of the bunch, Iron Widow by Shiran J. Zhao. This is an honest to God masterpiece of young adult science fiction. I loved this book to death. Iron Widow is inspired by Chinese history, and our protagonist was inspired by and named after China's first and only empress, Wu Zetian. Back when I lived in Shanghai, I remember getting into a conversation with a student of mine about Wu Zetian. I'd never heard of her before, I learned a bunch about her, and I was really, really interested. She was a fascinating historical character, the only empress that China ever had. And this novel is loosely inspired by her life, and our protagonist is called Wu Zetian. But this is a science fiction world. 2,000 years ago, an alien race landed on the Earth, decimated the population, and started taking over. And so the Great Wall was built to divide humans and the alien invaders. And for 2,000 years, humans have been at war with these aliens. They figured out that the metallic husks of these aliens could be turned into enormous mechs that people could pilot. Author Shelley Parker Chan, whom I am a huge fan of, called this book The Handmaid's Tale Meets Pacific Rim. And Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim is one of my favorite films of all time, so I was really excited. And Parker Chan was right. These enormous mechs are called chrysalises. And they, just like in Pacific Rim, have to be piloted by two people. But unlike in Pacific Rim, those two people are always a man and a woman. The male pilot is famous. In fact, they used to be leaders and now they're more like celebrities. And the female pilots are their concubines. And they basically exist as batteries. Their chi, their personal energy, is used as a battery to power the mech, the chrysalis, while the male pilot controls it, fights, and hopefully wins the battle. And there is always a very, very good chance that the concubine will die. Her energy will deplete and she will die by the end of the fight. Concubines are all but sacrifices. And our protagonist knows this very well because her big sister, only 80 days ago, was basically a sacrifice. She was sent off by her family to be a concubine and she died doing it, but Actually, she didn't. Wu Zetian knows that her sister was killed by the pilot's own hands. She didn't die in combat in the mech. He killed her. And Wu Zetian is gonna follow her sister's footsteps and avenge her sister by killing this pilot herself. She is a strong feminist young woman who is sick to the back teeth of patriarchy in all of its ways. In this world, just like throughout China's history, women have their feet bound. Foot binding was an horrific practice that went on for a long, long, long time that crushed and broke the bones of a woman's feet in her infancy, meaning that women had to hobble around, were in perpetual pain their entire lives, and were basically trapped by this because they couldn't move easily. Wu Zetian in this book has had this done to her. Her feet are bound and it's not gonna stop her. She is going to take revenge for her sister. But when she finally makes it to this point where this can happen, she starts to learn things. She learns about this pilot. When she gets into the mech with him, she finds out how it all works and the fact that you kind of go into this mind palace together. Through her chi, she's kind of absorbed into his brain, into his thoughts and memories, and she ends up fighting him in their internal consciousnesses. And she kills him. He dies. She kind of takes control of the mech and wins the fight. And from there, because of what happened, she is paired up with the most powerful pilot of them all. This pilot is called Li Shimin, and he is hated across the nation because he committed patricide 
and fratricide. He killed his brothers and his father. And many, many, many concubines have died in his service. He's gone to battle many times because he's the greatest pilot of them all, and so women have just been dying over and over again in service to him and his mech. But there's a lot more to him than meets the eye and she is about to become his partner. But concubines don't get to be called partners, because as I said, they're basically batteries. I can't tell you anything else about him, even though I'd like to, but this is a book that doesn't just explore patriarchy. It's not just a great feminist piece of science fiction. It's also a novel that explores class and racial divides. It's a book about how patriarchy isn't just about the divide between men and women, but about how patriarchy controls and divides us in multiple different ways, including those of class and race. It is fantastic. I could talk about this book for hours and hours and hours. I'm astonished by it. It's also a queer book that features polyamory, and that's really, really, really awesome. I'm amazed by how complex the feminism in this book is, because you've got a young woman who is rallying against the patriarchy, and along the way learning about class and racial divides as well, and so while she is angry, while she is fueled by her rage, she has a lot to learn, and she takes all of that on board, and it only makes her more worldly and fuels her fire even more. This is a remarkable piece of very exciting feminist science fiction inspired by a real historical Chinese person. Amazing. A masterpiece, a wonderful YA novel. I can't say enough wonderful things about this. Please, please check out Iron Widow. I did a video recently about how I have ignored YA fiction for too long, and so I tried to fix that by reading this and a bunch of other YA books I'm going to get to, and I'm thrilled. This is amazing. Check it out. There you go. Those were three sci-fi books that I read in a row, one that I have very complex and mixed thoughts on. I really, really appreciate it, but really dislike it in some ways. One that was a fun, wholesome adventure, and one that is a true YA science fiction feminist masterpiece that I loved from cover to cover. Check them all out, but especially Iron Widow. Iron Widow needs to be read. It's amazing. Shiran Jejao is an incredible writer. And subscribe for books.